Thank you all for coming and welcome to the Gray Associates Demand Trend webinar designed specifically for community college professionals. This is not your average webinar. It's an opportunity to gain insights into labor market data for program evaluation and use data to debunk common myths about community college programs. Again, I wanna thank you for attending. You will receive a link to the webinar recording and presentation slides in the next few days. Please look for it in your email. We have with us Bob Atkins. He's not only Gray's CEO, but also a program evaluation expert and best-selling author among higher ed publications. We do have a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a button labeled Q&A. Please feel free to add your questions there or feel free to put them in the chat. We will get to as many as we can during this session and we'll follow up later with you if we run out of time for your question. Meanwhile, have you been wondering about launching a particular new program or what the potential job market looks like for your students? Near the end of the presentation, we will give you the opportunity to review programs in real time with PES and Gray's Director of Customer Success. You can pop your program request into the Q&A or the chat at any time during the presentation. Now, without further ado, I will turn things over to Bob. Thank you very much, Marianne. I appreciate it. And again, thanks to all of you for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. I hope this uh, will be worthwhile for you. Today, we're gonna to talk about the demand for higher education programs and actually walk through one specific program. Uh, and uh, the flow is to describe what an overall program evaluation system is, for those of you who haven't seen that before. Uh, then we'll walk through indicators of student demand, employment, and we'll focus in on one program um, and go into that in more depth. As Marianne mentioned, I should say at the end too, if you have a particular program you'd like to look at, uh, please put it in the chat. We'd be glad to go through it with you. So we believe that Gray DI, as we now call ourselves, a Gray Decision Intelligence, has developed really the only complete program evaluation system. There are other folks who have uh, systems that do part of the work. They might, for example, tell you about labor markets, or they might tell you about financials for a given program, but they don't integrate all the data you need in order to make an informed decision. So what data is that? First, it's data about markets. Do students want the program? Uh, are there jobs for graduates? How heavy is the competition? What's the right degree level for this program? That flows into margins, because really markets in many ways cause margins uh, through student demand. Uh, and margins tells you, does this program make money or lose money um, at the margin? Does it cover its direct instructional costs? Now, you don't need to know that because you're trying to make money per se. You're not, none of you on the phone today are for-profit institutions. But you do need enough high margin programs to subsidize the smaller mission critical programs uh, that may not be able to stand on their own two feet financially. So that web of cross subsidies is an integral part of an institution and you need to understand how it's working in order to make effective program decisions. Of course, those decisions need to be consistent with your academic standards and even more importantly with the mission of the institution. Now, I'd love to tell you that with the advent of AI and ChatGPT, that we could give you an algorithm and it would just tell you what programs to start, stop, sustain, and grow. For better or worse, uh, definitely for better from our perspective, uh, that's not yet possible that we know of, um, and I doubt it will be possible in the in anytime soon. Uh, making good program decisions still requires judgment. It requires human beings involved in the right process. Um, now, that process does have to be quicker than we're accustomed to in higher ed, uh, but it, it can be quicker if the data is assembled and really agreed on in advance that these are the things we need to know before we launch a program um, so people can assemble that and the, and the process can move along relatively efficiently, well-informed, and importantly, with much less political weight uh, than it has had before. Uh, much more of the weight goes to the data when it's available and people have agreed on it in advance. So that's our view on what a program evaluation system is. The right data in the right software uh, going to the, the right people engaged in an effective and efficient process for making decisions. Now, uh, let's focus in on markets, which is really the topic for today's discussion. As I mentioned, that includes data on student demand, employment, competition, and degree fit, or the appropriate degree level for that program. Uh, we've got different kinds of indicators here. Almost all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with IPEDS, the um, Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. There, I said it. Um, 
it's a great system. It's got every program represented. It's a pretty good indicator of overall program size. But when it comes to trends, it's a bit of a problem. The most current iPads data is from 2022. We're about to load that up into our systems. Um, it should be available for us in our December webinar. We'll spend some time on it. But even 2022 data, which is the, the most current available, when you think about it in terms of what students decided to take, if you're a community college, they made that decision a year to two years before they uh, graduated, depending on when they chose it and when they entered and how long it took them to complete. So we're really looking at data from 2019 when it comes to student trends. And that's now three or more years old. So when it comes to trends, it's pretty out of date. Now we look at enrollment, um, that's quite different. Also very comprehensive. We get that from the National Center for Education Statistics. Pretty much everybody's in there that uh, files for Title IV funding, all programs are in there. However, the difference from, between enrollment and iPads is uh, enrollment's updated three times a year. Um, so it's much more current information about what people wanted, not quite today, but relatively recently. And then finally, Google, um, great indicator, uh, forward-looking. People are searching for programs before they take them. So when you think about Google, it's probably looking out three to 12 months, depending on the degree level, um, as students explore what programs they may choose to take. So past, present, and future, if you will, uh, at Christmas, these will become ghosts of the various time frames. So keep that in mind as you're using data. Um, really want to be over here in enrollment and Google when you're thinking about trends, iPads if you want to know who your competition is and roughly how big a program is. Let's start with leading indicators and see what Google's telling us. First things first, how do you read this chart? Well, um, the blue bar, the dark blue bar in the back is 2021 results. The medium blue bar is 2022, and the light blue bar is 2023. So what we want to see is a pattern, as we saw in September, where uh, 21 is less than 22 is less than 23 would be ideal. What's happening right now? Well, we're up 21% actually in Google search volumes in October of 2022, 23, excuse me. Very substantial increase. Um, and, you know, beginning of a trend, we were up in September, we're up in October, more or less even for a few months before that. Um, but generally speaking, this year, we've been behind, which is a bit of a worrisome indicator, and you'll see in a moment, um, that's flowed through to an enrollment as well. But a positive sign looking forward that things may be on the mend. By the way, speaking of on the mend, I'm not, I have a cold, so if I seem like I'm stuffy and my voice has gotten deeper, uh, it has, uh, so please bear with me. Um, in, let's look at what's growing out there. Now on the health side, uh, we've got five of our top 10 programs in terms of growth are all healthcare programs. MRI, health information records tech, massage therapy, and occup occupational therapy assistant. Among our top 10 fastest growing, we have three CTE programs, nail specialist and manicurist, cosmetology, and HVAC or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning um, tech up 36%, each of these up well over 35%. And finally, we have the random others, uh, legal assistant, paralegal, and tax preparation. We are coming into tax season, so I, this usually spikes around this time of year, and that'll run on through April, um, but uh, that's up 22% year over year. I guess the headline there is taxes are not getting any easier. When uh, we think about the consistency or the duration of growth, uh, what we found is it's extremely volatile. Um, only four of the programs that were in our top 10 fastest growing in 2022 are still in our top 10 fastest growing in 2023. Those four are HVAC maintenance tech, nail specialist and manicurist, MRI tech, and tax prep. I guess we're re reinforcing nothing certain like death and taxes. Um, the new ones, um, as you can see here over on the right-hand side, we're caught new entrants in the high growth. We're gonna look at cosmetology, rad tech, legal assistant, medical records, massage therapy, and occupational therapy assistant. Uh, when I look back to last year, it was clearly dominated by things ending in tech. So all our CTE programs, whether it's auto mechanics or MRI tech, they formed six of the top 10 last year and only one, two of the top 10 this year. So a bit of a shift in what's hot um, from 
tech programs to a more general assortment of different kinds of programs and resurgence in healthcare. Now, every click comes at a cost. Uh, and we keep track of this because many of you may use um, Google cost per click as an advertising methodology. Um, and particularly if you're online, this is how you attract students. So a course is more uh, attractive if it has lots of students and a relatively low cost per click. Oh, well, that's not usually how the world works. Um, so when we think about it in terms of cost from left to right, less than $10 per click, greater than $10 per click and greater than $20 per click. And this can get quite high. Um, we've got 39 of our tech pro of our um, associate programs down here in the less than $10 range, cosmetology, rad tech and office management and supervision. Not surprisingly, almost all those programs are going to be on site in person. Um, and those tend to be less expensive to bid for because you're up against fewer competitors. In the center at greater than 10 and less than $20 per click, building construction tech, building property maintenance, and motorcycle maintenance and repair tech. And then over on the right, we have a mix. Medical billing and coding is actually the most expensive single program. All of these are over $20 a click. Auto mechanics, big program, number of national players in that space. And then a very popular program, physical fitness tech um, over here on the right uh, with more than $20. Now, uh, let me put that cost per click in perspective. As all of you know, a click is not a student, is not an enroll. Um, in fact, it's not an app. Um, a click is just a click. And you're going to be seeing, um, you know, very rough numbers, 100 clicks to get one student, maybe more. So that $10 per click turns into $1,000 per enrolled student. So keep that in mind. This can get very expensive. Uh, it doesn't rule it out, uh, but you do have to keep that cost in mind. And we get up in the $20 range um, it's, it's started, and above, it's starting to get cost prohibitive. The cost of acquiring a student may actually exceed the value of a student. Now, let's take a look at some trends. And I'm going to start with enrollment. Um, on the enrollment front, we saw good news in total enrollment at the certificate level. It had been going down for a couple of years, down about 4% a year uh, for 18, 19. Uh, then in 2021, it basically flattened out up a little bit, 0.8%. In 21, 22, up 2%. So uh, it's a relief anytime we see growth in enrollment numbers. And here we're starting to see a bit of an upward trend in certificate level enrollment unfortunately offset by continued downward trend in total enrollment at the associates level. So that had been going down 2.3 and then two years at 8% or higher. Um, this year, the pace of decline has slowed and total enrollment's down just 3%. Now, recently we, we talked about new enrollment. Um, the good news is that new enrollment is actually up at the associates level. So this uh, downward trend in total enrollment starting to be uh, offset by growth in new enrollment, just keep that in mind. So there is uh, sunshine at the end of this tunnel. In 2023, the 10 largest programs in, uh, at the associates level and below, and here we're looking at certificates, accounted for 33% of total enrollment. Now keep in mind, we're looking at very, very large programs. The median program only had 218 students enrolled and all of these have 35,000 or more. So they're very large programs. The largest is liberal arts, sciences, and studies. Obviously, it's a transfer program for folks primarily interested in going on to four-year schools. Not surprisingly, nursing is in second place with 93,000 completions, followed by business, <coughs> but quite a big gap between nursing and business. Nursing's um, over 20% larger than business. General studies, uh, again, a transfer program, it's almost 70,000. Then welding, a very different kind of program. Now we're talking about a tech program teaching people vocational skills. Uh, 68,000 students enrolled. Medical clinical assistant, 51,000. Bookkeeping, 41,000, tied with EMT, more or less. Um, auto mechanic tech at 37,000. And finally, cosmetology. So very mixed group of programs, which is encouraging. Lots of interest across the spectrum in certificates. <coughs> So we um, look at fastest growing, Rad Tech tops the list, and cybersecurity is right up there. So this has been a hot program for a while. If you don't have it, you're trying to find something to grow, I would have a hard look at cybersecurity. The other obvious one these days that I think you could stand up relatively quickly 
would be to pr provide a certificate in artificial intelligence. In particular, uh, something, and this is not in our data because it doesn't exist yet as a SIP code, it won't for several years, uh, by which time it'll be pretty large. But this whole issue of prompt engineering, um, it, you know, can get very sophisticated and it's terribly important in getting the value out of um, AI, particularly generative AI. Uh, there are all sorts of other things you can do with that technology as well that people wouldn't necessarily imagine, um, whether that's creating drawings or what we've recently started to do, which is to feed numbers in a very structured way into ChatGPT and have it actually start to write text reports about those numbers. Uh, those require uh, prompts that run into a couple of pages in Word, so they're quite long and, and detailed, uh, but the result is we can get reports that look pretty good. Um, I wouldn't say they're great yet, uh, but they're at least the level of what I would call a first-year analyst. They're accurate. Um, they're a little dull, uh, and they're, but they are well-structured. So it's only a matter of time before we begin including those actually in our offerings to our clients. And I think they can be very helpful in general with dashboards. We've got people in a college who uh, don't really want to look at employees of numbers, but would be happy to read uh, the text about those numbers. Um, so it gives uh, different styles of learning, if you will, uh, or information retrieval, um, a better chance uh, than a stream of numeric uh, data. <laughs> For example, like uh, the data I'm presenting today, uh, computer information sciences at 18%. So, and then we've got three, four CTE programs, commercial truck and bus driver, fire science, auto mechanics, and auto body collision and repair tech, all up 9% or more. Entrepreneurship and childhood education and teaching up 8, 9%. Um, so what's big at the associates level? Well, liberal arts, again, a transfer program in general. Uh, general studies, speaking of transfer programs is number two. Then we get to our other two biggies that we've talked about, but in this case, business outpaces registered nursing 812,000 to 673,000 students enrolled. It really are incredible numbers when you think about it. Um, almost a million students enrolled in business uh, programs uh, at this point. Um, psychology, 216,000. Computer science, 213,000. Biology, liberal arts, both over 200,000 and biological and physical sciences, 155, and engineering, 146. In terms of growth, um, cybersecurity tops the list. Uh, this has been a very rapidly growing program. One thing to keep in mind is it used to be a small program growing fast. It is no longer a small program. It's a big program growing 20% or more. So um, that's a, an important place to be if you want to achieve enrollment growth. We still see growth in computer science. In a way, that surprises me. I would have thought many of the students who go into computer science would be end up in cybersecurity, but computer science is holding its own, up 9%. On the tech side, we also have information technology and, um, up 5%. Then uh, we've had arts become a uh, growth area recently. Here we see art, art studies general up 10%, and visual and performing arts up 5%. Health programs only take three of our fastest growing slots, surge tech up 8%, uh, rad tech up 7%, and diagnostic medical sonography or ultrasound tech up 6%. And then we have a couple of others, real estate and anthropology, both up over 5%. Now, uh, one of the important things here is we're quoting national numbers. Um, in truth, the numbers will vary uh, by local market. So New York in this case, you look at its programs, health services is up 11%. Uh, Computer science is number two. Registered nursing is number three in terms of growth. Uh, excuse me, total, uh, yeah, growth in enrollment. Um, then we have two that were flat, criminal justice and bookkeeping. Now look over on the right, and now we're looking at Texas. Now medical critical assistant makes a list, which is not over here in the top five. Cybersecurity makes a list, but again, not in the top five over here. Uh, none of these, in fact, are in the top five in New York. We'd probably pick up a couple if we went to the top 10. But this is important because uh, when we provide data to our clients, uh, we provide it at, for their local market, typically their state and their region as well. But that local market is terribly important because they're all different. <coughs> now let's take a look at non-degree courses. There are a lot of uh, uh, programs, courses, and students 
who sit outside the traditional higher education market and importantly outside of its reporting systems like IPEDS. These are all people who don't take Title IV funding, whether that's edX, Coursera, or Full Stack Academy. Uh, and so uh, since they don't take Title IV, they don't have to report. And uh, of course, since they don't have to, they generally don't. They are also uh, on their face enormous in some cases. Coursera alone has over 125 million students who've registered for their, per their courses. Udemy has even more. Um, the others are, rel are smaller, but still, in the case of edX, well into the millions. Now, please don't make the mistake of thinking that, uh, and we certainly don't make the mistake of thinking that a student enrolled in a massively online open course, a MOOC, is the same as a student who's come to your school. Not really the case. The odds of them going past class one are low. The odds of them completing are very, very low. You're looking at completion rates that are probably down in the single digits. But even if you do, th do that math and take them divide by uh, 100, that's still 1.2 million students who have completed a course in these platforms. So, and by the way, I don't think any, I'm aware that, of what the real completion rates are, and I'm sure they vary a lot by course. Um, but it is, I, I'm certain they're much less than the completion rates that you'd experience at a regular college. So just keep that in mind as we run through the numbers. Um, what's hot in these um, environments? Well, data and tech, especially. And here we're looking at Coursera, and we're looking at um, fastest growing programs at, excuse me, courses at these uh, institutions on, in these platforms. Um, this one, uh, with 5.6 million students um, who've enrolled uh, in, in October 2021, excuse me, um, this is going to be the uh, incremental students um, who've enrolled this year in that particular program. Uh, machine learning up 3 million, uh, software development up 2 million, personnel development up 2 million. Uh, if we were looking at uh, Udemy instead of Coursera, the whole top 10, maybe nine out of the top 10 would be tech programs. Um, uh, Coursera, while smaller, has a more diverse set of programs and, and students are interested in a wider variety of topics. Now, we've also got a significant a level of interest in design and product. Uh, learning English, I think this is typically um, English as a second language for foreign students, uh, leadership and management, basic science, business essentials, and support and operations. Let's shift gears. We've been talking about student demand. Um, it's encouraging, as we'll recall, it's up a little, you know, the enrollment numbers are down, but Google's up, so I think the future's looking a little bit brighter than it was. Uh, when we talk about employment, very important to uh, understand how this stuff is calculated. Uh, traditional calculations of the number of jobs available for a graduate of a given program uh, rested on the premise that students, uh, we should only really include occupations for which students are directly prepared. So if they studied literature and end up in a uh, investment bank, that wouldn't count. Uh, and in that view, uh, there are relatively few occupations that students prepared for. And as a result, what we see is that actually most students don't, in, don't go into programs for which they're directly prepared. So my x-axis here, along here, is the percentage of graduates who are going into a field for which they're directly prepared. And um, 60 to 80 percent of, I'm sorry, there are programs in which 60 to 80 percent of the students go into a field for which they're directly prepared. But there are only 11 of them out of our total data set of 634. So a very small percentage of students go into programs for which they're directly prepared. In fact, um, among programs where the graduates, zero to 19 percent of the graduates go into fields for which they're directly prepared, or it's called less than 20 percent of the graduates. That's 493 out of our 600 programs, well over two thirds of all programs, uh, fewer than 20 percent of the graduates go into fields for which they're directly prepared. They go on and do something else. Well, how big is the difference? If we look at a program like art, art studies um, and the direct prep jobs, we find is there are five of them. Um, and this comes from the National Center for Education Statistics Crosswalk. There are art, drama, music teachers, post-secondary, craft artists, fine artists, photographers, and secondary school teachers except career in tech and special education. Now, in reality, uh, these majors go into 729 different occupations. So they actually can find work in a lot of different areas. 
Um, in this case, a lot of them end up finding work in a field that does not require a college degree. So that's not what we would think of as a great outcome. I don't think it's what people expect to do when they're spending their money on college. But you can see that customer service representative, um, online merchants, cashiers, those are not the jobs we would hope for a college graduate to get. But there are many jobs that are uh, more that re do require a college degree. Um, general and operations managers, sales representatives often do, some don't. Um, special effects artists, sales managers, HR specialists, uh, computer user support specialists, maybe, maybe not. Um, but lots of diversity in terms of what people really do. Now, many of you may have noticed I skipped over chief, chief executives. Um, we should put a big caveat on that. Um, it's not, uh, these are not chief executives of Fortune 500 companies. One way you can tell is there are 543 of them and there are only 500 Fortune 500 companies. Um, so uh, what, what are these folks? Well, the, the definition of a senior executive in the, in the SOC taxonomy, the standard occupation code taxonomy, is the most senior person in a business. So that would include uh, the sole, the head of a sole proprietorship, you know, uh, the head of any small business, people like me, uh, the owner of a barbershop, all kinds of different uh, 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 fields where the business is either very small or uh, one person operation. Uh, those all get counted as, as chief executives if the person is running it. So just keep that in mind. It's not as exalted a title as it sounds. Um, if having been an entrepreneur for many years, um, that title often includes chief bottle washer, um, depending on the day. Now, um, if we look at a program where you'd expect people to go into the fields for which are directly prepared, um, and we picked auto tech, um, actually, it turns out it's pretty interesting. They, even in auto tech, they go into all sorts of different things. Now, we ran these numbers uh, a little while ago we found is about half of the folks over the course of their career, and we have about 15,000 people in this sample, 14,000, um, and we can see them over decades. Um, they About half end up being auto techs. Um, another half go into all sorts of other things. Um, they may run their own repair shop, as I mentioned, chief executives. They may go into electronics installation. Uh, what I found interesting, we have not seen this before, uh, uh, quite a good number of them uh, go end up in robotics, um, and then, of course, you know, they're going to go into auto repair, auto service tech, uh, automotive engineering technicians, uh, bus and truck mechanics, uh, so that, and parts salesmen is typically auto parts. Um, so that's not surprising, but it is a bit surprising to see them in robotics, though not as surprising anymore as it used to be. General and operations managers, uh, first line supervisors of, of mechanics, though, so this is them getting promoted, so that's very much in line. And um, computer user support specialists, uh, for some reason, they can get in there. And um, it is important to remember that an auto tech isn't what it used to be. Um, an auto tech used to be primarily about uh, turning a wrench, if you will. Um, the equipment that goes into diagnosing and fixing cars is now tremendously sophisticated. Um, and so the techs actually do have to have a high level of knowledge, for example, electronics um, and in the use of computers to do diagnostics. So um, that it makes some of these other roles now not, not as surprising, robotic tech in particular. Um, our car is getting close to being a robot, uh, though the performance of that robot's a bit mixed right now. So hopefully we won't have too many of them on the road running robotically. Um, now, what's happening to jobs? Uh, I think the job market is tightening up. Um, we can see it that this year's revenue, the light blue bars, below last year's revenue every month this year. Um, some of that is rebound from COVID where there's a big peak in job postings right after COVID. But I think that's run its course. And still we're seeing 20% drop year over year in uh, job postings for associate certificate graduates. So things are tightening up out there. We can look at that um, as a society and as an economy, that's probably mixed news. It's good news for inflation. Um, it's bad news for economic growth. As educators, um, it's actually good news. The tighter the job market, the greater the tendency is of students to come back and go to school. So um, hopefully this will drive some growth in enrollment and in turn um, enable students to graduate and go on to do better things than they could without a degree. Which occupations are seeing growth? 
Well, insurance has been up here a lot, many times. This is claims adjusters and investigators. Um, veterinary technologists and technicians up 27%. Bookkeeping, it's coming up on tax time, as I mentioned, um, up 20%. Self-enrichment teachers, demonstrators and product promoters, both up over 10%. Police up 9%. Dietitians up 7%. Coaches and scouts up a little bit, 4%. Exercise trainers and fitness instructors up 3 and diagnostic medical sonographers up three. Um, and you know some of this stuff is interesting because you'll see the growth rate in some fields, and I suspect this is true of diagnostic medical sonography, where the growth rate is actually not dictated by the amount of demand for diagnostic, diagnostic sonographers. The constraint is the number of students graduating. So the field can only grow as fast as it, um, we in uh, higher ed can produce graduates. Let's continue. Um, soft skills are in high demand. Um, what kinds of skills are we talking about? Management, um, customer service, planning, general operations, sales, leadership, supervision, scheduling, collaboration, and monitoring are the kinds of skills you see in many, many job postings, often underrated, uh, but the sorts of things people learn uh, in outside of their more specific technical courses. Now let's take a dive into the program of the month. And we're gonna cover the same uh, sorts of topics. Uh, we're gonna focus in on the market demand for a particular program. And when we do that, first we start with the individual program and we keep track of all 1500 iPads programs. So this list, if we were in our system, it, you could scroll down 1500 rows. Um, for those, we keep an overall score that blends together these scores for about 50 metrics, um, which I'll show you in a moment. Each metric is both scored and weighted, um, and those uh, weights can be dictated by you all, as can the scoring thresholds. One of the things we score on is student demand. We have a, a number of metrics for that, as well as competition and jobs. And finally, a degree fit. And here, um, since we don't know precisely what degree we're looking for, we've set that so all programs are equal with 100% degree fit. Uh, if we were working with you and we wanted to just do, say, associates, uh, we'd set uh, generally negative scores for anything that wouldn't be an appropriate fit for an associate's program, whether that's because the wages were too low to offer uh, a return on investment or because the degree level was too high to be appropriate for a community college. Um, you know, neurosurgery, for example, wouldn't be a great fit. So, uh, but here, everything's equally weighted for that. And today, let's take a look at network and systems administrator, a 99th percentile overall score. Because it's at the 99th percentile, it's got a dark green shading. Um, and uh, we can, all these are color coded. The colors are really meaningful, though they're not just for fun. Um, this light green is 95th percentile or higher. Um, yellow means it's not so great. Um, that's 40th percentile, the 70th percentile. And once it goes pink, that means it's in the 40th percentile or lower. So the simple way to remember this is green is good, red is bad. Um, and uh, also that we're really focused on percentiles, not individual absolute values of individual metrics. And I'll show you more about that in just a sec. So here's a cut of our uh, program scorecard. Um, and this one is a section of student demand. And what we can see is Google search volume is quite healthy. Um, there are 26,881 Google searches. And now the question becomes, is that a lot or little? And we can look over at our percentile and our color and say, well, it's good. It's not fabulous, 74th percentile. Um, so 26% of our programs are better, um, but it's still good. Um, that new student enrollment volume, on the other hand, up in the 90s, 93rd percentile. Uh, my on-ground completions in market institutions at 95th percentile. Online, 98th percentile. So that tells us this is a very hot program online in terms of overall student demand. It also suggests that 25% of all completions are online. So this is a program that's begun to make that transition from on ground to online quite effectively. Now, of course, the size of a program is the only thing you wanna know. You need to know whether it's growing or not. Um, in this case, Google search volume is up 9%. Uh, that's a 74th percentile growth rate. So that's very good, not great. But 9%, I think, for most of us would be a number to write home about uh, these days. Tough to find growth. Um, student enrollment volume, on the other hand, is down. 
and completion volume up a shade, 4%. Now, how do you interpret it when you have numbers that are saying different things? Uh, first of all, you have to recognize that that means the diagnosis, if you will, of growth is more uncertain because your metrics are coming back um, in contradiction one to another. If I were guessing what's going on here, completions were strong, uh, excuse me, enrollment was strong a few years ago, um, and, and that's driving the completions today. The enrollment more recently is down. That's the 6%, but it should perk up as we look forward. Uh, Google, again, being a forward-looking indicator, we'd expect that to flow through and see an uptick in this in the coming months. Uh, but as I said, the main message here, I think, when you get differences in these metrics, is it's not certain where we're headed in terms of growth. Clear it's a big program, not clear if it's a growing program. Now let's turn to employment. Um, you can tell immediately uh, overall it's dark green. That's great. You can see my um, entry level jobs are all green. Uh, not dark green, but green over the 90th percentile. Uh, got some good stuff going here in wages. And then I get a little bit worried when I look at uh, what's happening in terms of degree level. Um, and uh, finally, my uh, percent direct prep jobs. Let's slow down. We'll go through this in a little bit more depth. But I wanted to give you a sense of how you could look at this relatively quickly and understand what's going on. So as I mentioned, uh, it looks like we've got jobs available. We're at the 93rd, 94th percentile in terms of current employment. That is how many people are actually employed in the field right now with 10,000 job postings to hire new people. So um, uh, almost half the workforce needs to be, we need 50% more people in this field than we have today. It's a bit of an exaggeration because some of that's gonna be replacement um, and, and switching from employer to employer, but still very large number. Now it is a bit worrisome here. Um, we've got 19% of our grads who are underemployed. Um, now that turns out to be fifth percentile i.e. 90% of our programs have a higher uh, proportion of their graduates who are uh, in a job that does not require a college degree. In this case, that puts it at the fifth percentile amongst all programs. So, well, honestly, I find the 19th percentile worrisome. Not at all unusual. In fact, it's better than the norm by quite a bit. In terms of growth, uh, it's actually declining 2.6%. That puts it to 71st percentile. Remember that on average, uh, job posting is going down uh, 20%. So it's not surprising to see that um, this one's going down and that it could be going down and still be doing better than the average program. Um, historic growth has been zero. Uh, and as we look at job postings per graduate, it's at the 77th percentile. There are two job postings for every graduate. Honestly, that's where I begin to get worried that we're starting to get um, out of balance between the number of graduates and the number of jobs. Um, I like to see that number north of two. Uh, once it gets to one, uh, you're in a pretty ferociously competitive job market. So um, I, as I say, I think that job postings for graduates beginning to suggest that uh, this field is saturated on the employment side. Entry level wage, uh, this is for people coming out of this program. We use a 25th percentile uh, BLS wage for this. Um, good wage, 91st percentile at $53,000. Now, once they've been out in the market for a while, um, after three or four years, they come into the post-entry median at $64,000. And then they may go on to get a, a further degree. So if they get an associate's, it bumps it actually down slightly, um, up from the entry, but not as high as it would be um, just for the average person who didn't get an associate. Um, it's often that way. Um, Post-entry is 59. If they've gone on and gotten a bachelor's, it jumps to 75. And finally, if they get a master's, it's 83. Keep in mind uh, that their uh, bachelor's or master's may be in a different field. Now, a lot of these folks, um, even though it seems like a fairly specific job, only 17% are gonna go into a field for which they're directly prepared. So that business of looking at what people really do is important in this field as in most others. Competitive intensity. Um, this program is pretty competitive. All, most colleges have it. Uh, it's at the 94th percentile in terms of number of campuses. Um, a few dropped out. We have a drop of nine. So that's good. So less competitive than it used to be, but still very competitive. And by the way, 32 institutions offer this program online. Median program size. Um, not so exciting at seven. 
and it's dropping. Um, that always concerns me. It means that the typical school in the market is having trouble filling its classrooms. Uh, Google cost per click is getting expensive. This is at the 75th percentile, which suggests that uh, people are spending a fair amount to market these programs and attract students. Um, and that number is eight bucks. So remember that probably more like, well, it, that's a lot of money by the time you're done multiplying out 800 to $1,000 per student. Um, and the Google Competition Index is at 0.19. That's actually pretty low. Uh, that index runs from zero to one with one being most competitive. And again, you can see we've already got 17% of the institutions online and they're actually pulling in uh, more than their fair share of uh, graduates. 25% uh, of graduates are actually going through those online programs, not on ground. What's going on here? So who's playing in this market? Number one is ECPI. ECPI is a small, not small, excuse me, 11,000 student for-profit operating out of Virginia, um, 224 completions. Uh, they're gonna be out there online competing hard to win these students. Then we see University of Phoenix in Arizona with 182, Embry-Riddle 167. Uh, my computer career, probably a for-profit as well at 78 and so forth down our list. Um, Gwinnett, um, Atlanta and Georgia all, and actually Chattahoochee as well, all over 50 and Seminole State 42, and Central Georgia Technical at 39. Pretty heavy representation of, of Georgia in that list. So what degree level uh, should people have to go into this field? We do this a little bit of a funny order. Um, first, uh, let's talk about the cost of you offering it. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than average. Uh, the median cost per student credit hour is 0.7 is and this is indexed. So again, a zero to one scale. Um, at 0.73, um, this program is a little more expensive than the norm uh, to run with 0.5 being the norm. Um, so keep that in mind if you're thinking of offering it, it's, it, as I say, a little bit more expensive than usual. Uh, what, what we see here is that in the workforce, we've got uh, most of our graduates, uh, relatively few of our, let's do it this way, relatively few of our graduates are at the bachelor's level or less. 39, excuse me, less than a bachelor's, 29%. And then we've got the lion's share of them um, actually at bachelor's and above. That 64% have got a bachelor's degree or more. What, we're, what are we producing as schools? Well, actually, we're kind of got this thing um, backwards. We're doing 62% at the certificate level, 32% at the associate's level, and very, very little 6% at bachelor's and above. So what this suggests is not that we shouldn't be doing associate's level degrees, but that there may be an opportunity here at more senior, to offer degrees at a higher level um, for folks. So for those of you as community colleges that can offer some bachelor's level programs, this is an intriguing opportunity. One thing people generally don't take into account when they're thinking about programs to start or grow is what the demographics of those programs are likely to be. We're often concerned with DEI, uh, but we don't think of it as a programmatic issue. But each program comes with its own unique demographic fingerprint. In this case, you can see that 82% of the folks in this program are men, 19% are women, and 1% uh, is rounding error. Um, a very particular demographic there. Uh, but if we we're trying to increase the percentage of men on campus, this would be an interesting program to offer. It has almost twice as many men in it as the average program in the market. Um, and keep in mind that that overall market of 6139, and we've got almost one and a half women in school for every man. Um, so finding programs that could beef up male enrollment to college, I think would be uh, an interesting and often overlooked aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a huge boon for all the men who are gonna end up out there without a college degree wondering why they're having trouble getting a job and they're underpaid. Now, it also has a bit of a de different um, mix in terms of demographics. Uh, among all programs, 12% of the population are black, but this one actually is 27%, so we're picking up an important demographic there. Hispanic, but just the opposite. Uh, relatively few Hispanics enrolled here, 15% versus 25% of the local population. And white, we're just about dead on, um, 45 to 47. 
and a little bit of international and unknown um, here towards the bottom. So if we were trying to beef up men and, uh, and uh, black students on campus, um, this would be a very intriguing program. Not gonna help us much with Hispanics and certainly not gonna help us much in terms of recruiting women. Now, the other side of that, of course, is should we be encouraging more women to go into this program? That's a great question. I think it's oftentimes not a bad idea. Uh, women tend to shy away from, this is a, a super field, but things like engineering and anything technical tend to have a much lower enrollment of women, which is a shame, uh, often they're very well-paid careers. By the way, the reverse is true in healthcare, um, particularly nursing, where it's almost all female, and many men would be well advised uh, to explore those fields um, because they're, they make for good careers. Here is the full program scorecard. Um, it's a bit of a blizzard, which is why I showed it to you in pieces. You might well ask yourself, why do we put all this stuff on one page? And the answer is when you're trying to make a decision, it's actually very helpful uh, to have it all on one page, not have to hunt around through a variety of documents to find the information you need. The other reason is that you quickly get the ability to understand this almost at a glance. Here in this, I can see, first of all, my overall rating, dark green, very good. So why is that? Student demand's green, employment's dark green. Okay, so I've got two important indicators that are very healthy. Uh, competition, it's pretty intense competition, so that's the catch. Um, and then I can again go into my by color and see where the particular strengths are and the areas where I need to be concerned. So that's why we do it on one page is to try and give you make it quicker for you to evaluate the market for a program. So let me summarize. In October, Google searches for direct workforce programs was 21% year over year. MRI Tech in particular was our fastest growing program, up 59%. Medical billing and coding continues to be an expensive program to market with the highest cost per click. Certificate enrollment was up 2% year over year. Finally, we're seeing some growth. And associate enrollment was down a little bit. I hope that Google search is a, an indicator that that's going to start to turn around uh, in the near-term future. Rad tech programs had the fastest enrollment growth at the associate level in 2023. The associate in cybersecurity was up by 2022, excuse me, by 22% as well. As I mentioned, most traditional labor market sources are going to rely on direct prep crosswalks. They're pretty far, they're pretty inaccurate, actually. And as we reviewed, uh, they would suggest that only five careers for art studies graduates really they go into 729 occupations. I will say some of those are not, not ideal. They're uh, occupations that require less than a college degree. <coughs> Auto tech. Our graduates go into 661 occupations, not three, and are starting to work in some pretty cutting edge fields like robotics. There's a strong demand for network systems and, admin, and admin programs. Student demand is strong. Employment opportunities are great. Wages are good. Um, but we're a little bit out of sync in terms of who's graduating with what degree. 64% of the workforce held a bachelor's degree or higher, while most graduates in, in the programs were associate's degree or lower. With that, let me thank you again. I hope you'll join us in our upcoming webinars. We'll hold one on Wednesday, December 20th at two for community colleges and the 21st for bachelors and above. And now what I'd like to do is open the floor and um, give you guys a chance to take a look at programs that are of particular interest to you. And I'm gonna turn over my screen to Anel who will walk through um, the programs that you choose. Thank you, Bob. So again, either in the chat or in the Q&A, please just um, let us know uh, what programs you'd like to have a look at. So uh, why don't we uh, take a look? I've got a request here for associate in business. Great. Um, associates in business, very general. So yep. I will and go we're ahead. looking at the national level. If we were, if if you were a client, you'd be looking at your probably at your uh, particular market, which we would set up for you. Um, yes, yeah, so we're, we're selected yeah, so associates. Yep, yeah, we're looking at a national level here, associates and below. Um, you know, Bob mentioned business, and I made the comment that it's general, but the system will make it very easy for us to really dive into the specific zip code that we're looking at, filtered in here by the fifty twos. I'm just going to go ahead and look at kind of business administration and management that kind of catch all business zip code 520201. All right, hold um, on a sec before you do that. 
Yep. Because uh, this view is actually quite important. Uh, what we've done, what what Winnell has done, is picked out everything under the um, two-digit zip code, the general zip code, if you will, or category of business. And so, if you were trying, if you're uh, the business um, college at a university, um, this would be your universe of programs that you might want to consider. Yep. And so, he's been able to select all of those. So you could scroll through those and see what's available to you. Yep. Now we're going to get a little deeper. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just move forward with fifty-two hundred two hundred one here. Go ahead and select that. Um, the beauty of having the rank, however, though, is you know when I go into 520201, I'm going into it knowing there are a lot of other zip codes that could relate very closely to this one. Um, and I think that's very important when we're considering you know student demand, when we're considering employment, when we're considering competitive intensity, right? Uh, to get the true competition of an area like this, we we might also want to start looking at this from a kind of four digit zip code level, a more macro level view. But for this example, we're looking at a very detailed scorecard for 520201 Business Administration Management General. Um, at a quick glance, the the color scale here will allow me to see that, you know, student demand and employment are strong for business administration management in general. Um, the questions seem to happen or exist here in under competitive intensity. Yeah, pretty much everybody has a business program, right? So not yep. surprising. Um, now we're also looking at this at the associates and below level. So something I just wanna quickly look at here would be the percentage of completions for national completions by level, as well as the workforce educational attainment. This will give us a sense of, you know, students completing this degree, what award level are they completing it in? And how do enrollments compare to that? And we can see here uh, nationally about 42% of completions for this program are happening at the bachelor's level. Um, but there does seem to be an existing pool of students completing this at the associates and certificate level as well. And we see 33% um, of enrollment at the associates level in this zip code as well. Okay. So this is almost 50% attrition. Right, to yep. get thirty three percent enrolled to nineteen percent of complete, but I may be jumping to a conclusion there. Um, so really quickly, I'll highlight some of the metrics that kind of pop up to me here, pop out to me here. Very strong size metrics under complete uh, student demand. Um, so this is a very large area, right? Whether it's Google search volumes being very large, and again, very easy for me to say something like this is very large. Right, because when I see this 1.3 million for Google search volumes, I know that this 1.3 million for this SIP code is at the 99th percentile, right? So meaning nationally, not many other programs were able to have a higher Google search volume than this, right? So large size, um, but the growth, right? Google search volumes seem to be decreasing um, year over year. New student enrollments are decreasing year over year. Um, and the units here look very scary, right? 29,000 is actually one of the largest kind of absolute values that we have here. Um, but when we put this up against percentage, you'll notice it's, it's not as scary, right? This is just a very large volatile um, volume here. I think what's going on here is, um, and you've got this difference between completion volume, Google search and new enrollment. When they gang up new enrollment and Google search um, and say the same thing, I think what we're seeing is completion is looking backwards. And this was um, a big uh, growing program a few years ago. And that's actually shifted. And new student enrollment starting to drop off. And the Google search is dropping off consistent with that, the more current indicators. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that interest in business as a concept is going down. But I do think it's getting divided up amongst other programs. Yep. Uh, things like data analysis um, and more specific um, business programs like marketing. Um, yeah. And I think that's why it's very important to sometimes take that kind of macro level view, maybe at a four digit level. And keep in mind, our system, we won't get into that today, but we would be able to kind of jump into the competitors tab, look at a family of programs and see, you know, if business administration is down, what other areas of business might be up and we might be able to, you know, identify where the interest is shifting. Um, 
Any questions or anything that I didn't highlight here that I should have? Oh, wages might be uh, good to look at. They're pretty good. At or above average, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're seeing decent wages here. The one thing I find interesting about this program, it's one of the very few that is pretty demographically neutral. Um, still a little skewed female to male. Uh, it used to be um, the other way around, by the way, not so long ago. Um, and all the other demographics are about the same for the program as they are for the overall market. Um, so it's a good general program that tends to attract all sorts of different students. Yeah, we just got a question, Bob, about uh, what would we consider a direct prep job for, you know, general business? I think um, you know, manager, comma, other um, uh, operations manager, things like that. Yeah, and it's 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 a long list uh, attributed to to business. Um, the, the the skills are are so transferable um, that it does kind of touch a lot of different places directly. Um, and we have crosswalks um, that you know, if you had access to a system like this, you would be able to kind of answer that question, right? What do we consider as a direct prep job? You would be able to see those. Um, any other questions? Did that, uh, Christina, did that answer your question? Yeah, and, and I won't click it, Christina, but you'll see here, there's a crosswalks. We can see program, we also have program crosswalks. That's a little different. Um, and we have employment crosswalks. Let's go ahead and look at it. I think it's, this is one of the bigger innovations we've made recently yep. um, is to really move away from the direct prep concept um, because it's, as I politely put it, counterfactual i.e. it's not closely aligned with reality, um, and begin to use uh, a database of resumes we have on some 70 million people that tell us uh, where they went to school, what they studied, what their degree level is uh, that they've achieved in their first, second, and any other degrees they have, uh, and what jobs they've held since graduation. And uh, then we classify all those jobs and occupation codes, and we can see what people really do with the degree. Um, now here, you see, number one is chief executives. Uh, that makes more sense for business graduates. But remember that it's all sorts of things besides uh, Fortune 500 CEOs. Mm -hmm. But general operations managers, no surprise. Legislators, a bit, not one you wouldn't expect to see for a business major, but still is, uh, one of the more common. Mm -hmm. And um, why don't I we think the story here is on that high field. Uh, why don't we stock share of SIP graduates? So that would tell us what percentage of SIP graduates went into a given field. Uh, do it the other way around, yeah. Probably is how it's sorted to start with. Hmm. I think the sort might be broken. It did I think sort. We're not, we're not going to say hi for any of these, actually, Bob. Let's oh, see. really? Yeah. So we can do medium. Okay. Maybe. So what this says is that um, the percentage of business administration uh, graduates, business administration graduates, the percentage of general operations managers is average. So there mm -hmm. are one way of interpreting that is there are lots of other people who also become general and operations managers. Yeah. And I, I I would say general business is one of the trickier ones just because it's so it, it the skills are very transferable. The list isn't usually this long, right? This is one of the longer lists that we have. Um, but what's important here is we're not gonna, you know, double count or over count job opportunities, which is what's going on here with the the share of SIP codes uh or the share of um SIP graduates versus the share of SOC employees here. There's something going on in the back end to kind of make sure we're not overcounting job opportunities as well. Any other questions out there? Let's take a look at a big community college program. Um, something like, uh, let's see what's going on with medical assisting. Medical, medical clinical assistant, yeah, 5108 to 
I'm trying to pretend I remember the SOC code or the SIP code, which I really don't. Right. This is one of those programs people don't think about necessarily, um, but it, it has been much bigger. It remains one of the biggest programs in the United States in terms of number of graduates. Uh, it is a certificate program typically, although some people awarded an associate's, you can see 11% over there. Um, it's not a bad program for people to come into and get out and get working. It can be done in a year. Um, and there are a lot of jobs if you just walking across this. So the probably the most prominent thing to me is 99th percentile on entry level jobs on all three metrics. So a ton of jobs out there. Um, job postings per graduate for, so, you know, way more um, jobs than our graduates and um, strong student demand. Like we're at the 99th percentile in almost all our metrics. Growth is more mixed in terms of student demand. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, this was dropping very fast for a while uh, when the for-profits got knocked out of this market. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a fair amount of latent demand um, out there. Uh, this really was, um, I think, three or four times as big as it is now. Um, at one point, it was 250,000 completions a year. Um, so, you know, when that market was heavily stimulated by advertising, we could argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, there are a lot more students who are interested in this program. The pay is the problem. Um, you know, the entry level pay is thirty thousand um, dollars. Post entry median is fifty. That's actually not bad. Um, that's kind of think of that as a mid career wage, um, and the rest are sort of irrelevant because uh, very few uh, people who come into this are going to end up uh, getting a further degree. But I have met a, recently, you know, in my visits to the doctor, you'll often meet somebody who's studying to be a PA or a nurse practitioner. Um, less so a nurse practitioner, more PA, a physician's assistant, who's taking its turn as a medical assistant to get their clinical hours. So if there are no other questions, um, we'll wrap it up for the day. Um, I hope all of you will, will join us again next month. In the meantime, if you're having trouble sleeping, I have a cure. You can always buy my book on Amazon. I promise it'll put you right to sleep. Uh, but it will, in the process, explain how to do a better job of data-informed program evaluation and management. Thanks again, and uh, look forward to seeing you just before Christmas. <laughs>